Good morning, everyone. My name is Julie Wanzer, I'm the owner of Business Rewritten, and we're a marketing communications firm that focuses solely on the AEC industry. We tell stories in the built environment. And I'm here this morning to present to you about seller doer business development best practices and strategies. I guarantee almost everyone in this room here is a seller doer, whether you know it or not, or whether you like it or not, right? So if you're gonna be put in that situation, let's make the best use of your time and dig in on some best practices. Uh, first, a little bit about me. I grew up a military brat, okay? Moved around the US quite a bit, lived abroad in Germany for a while. Uh, so I like to say that Colorado is the first state that I chose to move to, right? Me making a decision, we're going to Colorado. And when I moved out here, of course, I adopted the Broncos as my home team. My poor, well, I guess they were Redskins at the time. Now they're Nationals, I believe. I don't know. Don't quote me on that, <laughs> what the Washington NFL team is. Um, but we tried to make it to at least one home game a year. Um, also, growing up in the military and moving around quite a bit, obviously developed a love of travel, right? So there's a photo of us in Cancun for one of our best friend's wedding. Um, also trying to instill a love and travel in Kylie, Blake's daughter who's now 14, this was us in New Orleans last year, getting to try different food and meet different people. Um, and then also to I'd be, <laughs> I love pointing out this picture, it's one of my favorite. I actually got engaged last September in Vegas. This was, picture was taken by a complete total stranger. It is now my favorite photo of Blake and I. <laughs> um, and of course, our little Corgi Hank uh, with his watermelon. Um, so I've had about 20 years of marketing experience. I graduated in 2003 from the University of Maryland, Robert H. Smith School of Business in marketing, yes, go Terps, right? Yes, <laughs> that's usually unheard of out here, right? We went from ACC to the Big Ten, Ugh. Um, <laughs> but I've actually have stayed in the marketing field, which has been great, and I've been honored to spend the last 15 years working in the AEC industry. So I started in 2008 in McGraw-Hill Construction back in Washington, D.C. on the editorial side, right? So I got to interview owners, developers, architects, engineers about your projects. You guys like to talk about yourselves, right? Um, and I got to learn quite a bit and learn how to tell that story, right? Then when I moved here to Colorado in 2010, I worked in-house at Farnsworth Group. I got their ACEC member firm. <laughs> if you know Dave DeFulvio, he used to be my boss. So if you can survive Dave and learn and grow and succeed, got it, right? He, I love him. I learned so much from him. Uh, then was a marketing manager at Clip Architecture, which is now Canon design, <laughs> everybody's changing names. So I got to learn from the best, honestly, right? All those principles were seller doers, right? They had their own market practice, their own focus. So I got to pick up their best tips and tricks. Also got to see what they were doing wrong, right? <laughs> Not everybody is successful in this seller doer role. Uh, so sometimes I'm sure we all know we learn more from our mistakes than what we do actually well. Um, then eight years ago, I became a full-time seller doer myself as a business owner when I opened up my marketing communication firm. So there's that breadth of knowing and seeing what seller doers are doing in-house, right? And having that experience to support them that way. But then also being a business owner myself, little nuances, right? Little different things. Before we jump in, let's do a little poll. I want to see who's here in the audience. Keep it simple. All you got to do is raise your hand. Where are my marketing business development people? Where are you at? Oh, good. All right. It's your good, strong presence. What about my project engineers? Anybody? Okay, a couple in the room. Project managers, PMs. Ooh, there's a lot of you, right? <laughs> uh, director of vice president level. Yeah, okay, still got a good representation. Principals, business owners. Heck yeah, right? Buck stops with you. <laughs> now let's talk about what your familiarity is with seller doer. A's, I have no idea what you're talking about. Anybody wanna raise their hand? No, okay, <laughs> that's good. You at least have a sound basis. What about, I think this is my role. Anyone, kind of, maybe it's a half hand, right? I kind of think. <laughs> if you think you're a seller doer, you are a seller doer. So you're in the right place. Uh, what about, I want to be a better seller doer, right? Yeah, who wants to be better, right? Always. Kind of turning that around. I have years of experience. I'm going to give this presentation. Who's still keeping their hand up? Oh, I saw you <laughs> in the back. There you go. <laughs> done, done, and done. All right, good. Well, I think, again, we've got a variety of people here in this room, and we can all learn something uh, from everyone. All right, so what are our key takeaways here? As seller doers, your biggest, your best friend and your worst enemy, time management, right? How do you spend your time? Billable versus business development. What does that look like? We're gonna go through some ways to make some good use of your time. Next part, we'll be focusing on building trust with your clients, 
And this is what I like to say, your trust is the currency that helps you win more work. Trust is the currency to help you win more work. Helps you bypass that awful RFP process, right? Spending weeks, months developing something that guess what, the owner's probably not even reading because they already know who their trusted partners are and who they're gonna hire. They go through stacks of RFPs. They already know, most likely. So how do they know? They've built trust. Then the second part of the presentation will go through some situational strategies, right? We all find ourselves in conferences like this, right? Professional happy hours, uh, OAC meetings. Those are all opportunities where you can be a seller doer. All right, seller doer, woo! Guess what? In reading uh, this, if you read the program description to be here this morning, I referenced a report from SMPS, the Society for Marketing of Professional Services. Got that acronym right? <laughs> they put out a study in 2018. They surveyed the country of AEC firms and they found that 75% of firms reported that their technical staff also has business development res responsibilities. 75%. That's probably almost all of you in this room, a good quarter portion of you, right? So if you're being put in that position, right, where you have to do some business development, ooh, what does that even mean, right? Well, the good news is you're not a salesperson. You're not selling anything, right? It's a common misnomer, seller, doer. Sells in the first part of the word, I get it. But please, don't make cold calls. Do not show up at architects' offices thinking you're unannounced, thinking you're gonna do a lunch and learn. No, no, they're gonna <laughs> toss you aside, you look desperate, don't do it, right? But the even better news is that a true seller-doer is a problem solver, Ooh, right? And as engineers, guess what? You guys are already doing that, right? That's literally what engineers do. You're analytical, you do research, and you help people solve problems. So again, without even knowing it, you guys are all seller-doers. But the, again, we go back to this seesaw of time. In the ideal world, your seller doers are balancing that billable work and their business development. But we all know what happens in the real world. Billable work weighs you down and you've got your business development activities kind of floating up here, right? Guess what, when you're weighed down by billable work, your seller doer competitors are taking all these opportunities that you left floating, okay? It happens. So when we talk about billable work versus, versus business development, you guys have been to school. You know what billable work is. You know how to be an engineer. You know how to do projects. But what's business development, right? What does that mean? Anybody? Business development, what does it mean to you? Relationships, Relationships yes. What else? <laughs> I'm going to say yes and no. Half answer. Anybody else? Business development? All right. Guess what? It is not sales. It is not ROI, right? <laughs> I can't tell you how many clients have hired me to talk, uh, to train them on business development and seller doer activities, and they're already putting goals on their seller doers. Guess what? You guys are stressed out enough trying to do your billable work, make sure that projects are being done on time. You don't need another sales goal to put on top of that, okay? Let's divorce the two, please. And really focus in on business development relationship, mutually beneficial relationship. The Bob who said it best, Bob Berg, offer of the go-giver leader says, networking is simply cultivating mutually beneficial, give and take, win-win relationships. Works best, however, when you emphasize the give part. It works best when you emphasize the give part. Everybody here in this room has something to give. You have some level of expertise that you need to be able to share with people, and that's how you're doing business development, right? The other second part of business development is this trust. Right? When trust becomes your currency to win more work. And what does trust mean? What are the components? Sincerity, that's definitely a big one, right? Be yourself. I know it sounds so contrite, but it's true. People tell me, Julie, you're too loud, too joyful, you laugh too much, all the things. Guess what? <laughs> I'm not changing for any of you, right? Because that's me, that's who I am. If I was standing in the corner like this behind the curtain, um, <laughs> No one wanted to listen to me, first of all, and I'm not being my sincere, true self, right? So be yourself, whatever that is. Be reliable, right? Please, please, please do what you say you're gonna do. It's a very, very simple rule. Most people don't, right? Oh yeah, I'll get back to you tomorrow. Did you get back to them tomorrow, right? Set expectations and meet those expectations. 
I think the most underrated component of trust is consistency, okay? This is a little quote from Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. You might know him. <laughs> but he says, success isn't always about greatness. It's about consistency. Consistent hard work leads to success. Greatness will come, okay? There, any consulting engineering firm, I'm gonna put this out there, any consulting engineering firm can design a K-12 school once and do it good, right? Passable, it's opening, you can do it good once. But the, what are the firms or who are the firms that consistently do it well, right? They now become the preferred K-12 design engineer. Ooh, right, you know why? They built up a lot of trust. They do it consistently well over and over and over again. And they bypass the RFP process. Think about it. All right, so now let's get into the meat for our seller doer best practices. Again, the number one question I get when I'm being hired on by firms to train seller doers, time management, right? How am I spending my time? How am I doing this balancing act? I'm gonna warn you, <laughs> this chart's a little overwhelming. Whew, breathe it in, breathe it in. Um, <laughs> but again, this is based on my own research um, and obviously working both in the industry, in-house, right, and seeing it from a, a seller-doer standpoint. But I really want you to focus on this square, right? So first off, if you're a seller-doer expert, you've been in a seller-doer role in your firm for 10 or more years, you should be probably doing more 80-20 than the 70-30 split. You're good at your job, people know you, forget that. <laughs> but if your firm now, um, the way that I'd like to break it up is whether your firm has brand recognition or not, or your new firm. So if your firm's been around a while, they, you have brand recognition, everybody knows you, and you're looking to tap those next set of generation of seller doers, those PMs who are expressing interest and wanna get out more, start with 70-30, right? 70% 70 of your time should still be billable, but let's dip your toe in the water, right? Maybe go to a conference once a quarter or write a best practices article, whatever that is. Then after at least five years, I know, five years, long time, <laughs> then you can kind of bounce out to more 60-40 split. On the flip side of that, if you are three engineers who left AECOM, I don't know why you would, but you would start your own business, congratulations. <laughs> Hopefully, your mindset of a seller doer is gonna be a little different, right? Hopefully, you've brought at least one client over for you so you can at least spend 30% of your time billable. But guess what? If you're starting a brand new firm, you're gonna be on the hustle, right? You're gonna have to be go out there, meeting clients, developing your own relationships, right? Super important. So think about that and how you spend your time. What are some seller doer activities, right? When were you gonna do for those new people that they have 30% now of their time dedicated to business development? It's not all about speaking at conferences or attending them. You can write best practices article, right? Um, you can actually do some research to help identify opportunities with your existing clients, that's your low hanging fruit, before your competitors do, right? Because you have such a good relationship with them, your client trusts you, ooh, trust, currency, win more work, uh, that you're already anticipating the next project. You're talking about it as you're finishing up the next one. Again, no RFPs, don't do it, right? Build that trust. All right, next thing. So now that we've talked about how you're splitting your time, I really encourage my clients to develop a client strategy, right, and what does that look like? So in the fall of 2021, I took a entrepreneurial master class, master program, kind of like MBA on speed for 10 weeks, fully immersive program. And we talked a lot about the ideal client. What does that look like? So I took all of that information, wrote an article that was published by the Associated General Contractors of America about redefining success in the AEC industry. And one of the big components of that this is an Excel spreadsheet. Hopefully my engineers are getting excited, right? Business development, it isn't all about just talking to people. Let's do some analysis first, right? So I present this uh, to clients. I do have this with all the numbers. If you'd like it afterwards, send me an email. Um, to rate your clients, right? But to think about them from an engagement quality, that project. How'd that last project go? Did you meet the deadline? Were you paid on time? Ooh, <laughs> right? Were you chasing 30, 60, 90? 120 day remittance payments, right? Think about that. Um, also, how did that client, how did that project go with your team? Was your team drained and burned out and wanted to cry and leave the whole time? <sighs> Maybe that's not the right project or the right client for your particular team. So think about that. Also then, the cl client quality. I mentioned getting paid on time. Woo, 
Ooh, that's a big one, right? Especially for small businesses. But also think about, did that client pick up the phone when you called? What happened when there's a problem? Guess what? There's problems on every single project. How did you guys handle it? Were they um, withdrawn and weren't giving you information so that you're making assumptions and making bad decisions and so on and so forth? Or was this client super responsive? Hey, I got this. We've got this issue. How can we solve it? Right? So think about that. Then also, at the end of the day, we're all here to make money. We're in businesses. How much that client contribute to your bottom line, to your revenue, right? So once you've kind of mapped all that out, there are outliers, let's be honest, <laughs> right? If you have a client that is uh, very challenging, right? But they pay you a lot of money, there's a business case for that to keep that client. I'm not saying dump all of your quote bad clients, uh, but think about, again, how they contribute to your revenue, how they affect your team, and how you're able to run your projects. So once you've kind of done that, uh, so again, I love my seesaws, obviously. <laughs> you, um, balancing firm revenue and client quality, uh, it, yeah, kind of an okay situation to be in. I argue that your firm revenue should be deep, should be heavy, right? And your client quality should be really high. So think about how you're going to get there. And doing this process too, think about your ideal client, right? Who is that? What are their characteristics? Obviously, market type, project size are the obvious ones. I really challenge my clients to consider communication style. Is your client responsive or are they ghosting you? Ugh, how can you get a project done if no one's there to answer your emails or your RFIs, whatever that is? Make sure that you have a good fit with however you communicate. Also, too, get into their fears and passions, right? What keeps them up at night? What is their anxiety about on this certain project? And also, what do they get excited about? We all know that some of these projects take two, three years, and you're working with the same people. Get to know them, right? <laughs> Get to know what they're excited about. Again, it's helping you build that trust and building that firm relationship. All right, so we've gone through how you're going to spend your time, you developed a stellar client strategy. Now it's time to do a little bit of research, right? Let's look at those market trends. And here are some common questions. What are your common pain points, right? What are you seeing in the industry that is affecting your clients? Even better, what external factors? are affecting the marketplace right now. When I gave this presentation last year at the National Association of Women in Construction, we were still talking about supply chain logistics, the cost of construction materials, still COVID vaccines, those mandates. Guess what? This year we're talking about inflation, recession. Are we in one? I don't know, right? <laughs> the point is, right? We probably already are. Uh, the point is <laughs> that there will always be external factors affecting your clients. Your job is to stay abreast of what those external factors are and how they affect your different clients differently, right? Your K-12 uh, will have different issues than your bridge clients, right? Think about how different external market factors affect your clients differently, and then at the end of the day, provide them a solution, right? Be an engineer, be a problem solver. Anticipate market conditions and what their common pain points are and provide them solutions. Another thing you want to look at is the competitors, right? Who are you going up against that you keep getting number two or number three? They are, they're always ranked number one. Oh, that hurts. Number two is the worst, right? Nobody wants to be number two. Um, but there's got to be a reason why these firms keep beating you out. I know on the public side, they have a much more transparent process about proposal debriefs or project debriefs. You can even request copies of proposals, different things. I will tell you that not always the most reliable information, right? To me, the better source would be actually talking to the client. Why, why did you end up working with those people? What other projects do you have coming up? How can my firm help you, right? Um, and as you're going through these things, think about why your competitors are winning those jobs, but also consider what you can offer that those other firms can't, right? Nobody's perfect. Perfect is boring, okay? We each, each of us as individuals and each of us as firms, have something unique to contribute to your clients. That's your value add, right? Figure out what that is and talk about it. All right, so these next two kind of go hand in hand about networking, right? So you figure out how you're spending your time, you've got a great client strategy, you know exactly who your ideal client is, you've done your research, now let's start networking. Obviously, hopefully all of you in this room are ACEC Colorado members, right? 
and you're among your peers, which is great. Uh, but what I like to challenge my clients to do is consider the whole vertical. Where are your clients spending their time, right? If you work on the private side with a lot of owners, developers, you need to be at the Urban Land Institute. If you're reliant on architects to feed you, better be an AIA member, right? Get to know what, go to their conferences, figure out what their pain points are, what's affecting them in their environment. Um, it can also be by a uh, market sector, right? If you're really big into healthcare, Ashi is a good one, K-Head is another one here in Colorado. Those are where your clients are. You need to meet them where they're at, learn more about them. And then I threw the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce, get creative, right? Go where your competitors aren't, right? Learn more about the communities that you're building in. Be invested, right? If you show up, whew, that's half the battle. Uh, but then also if you show up, right? Don't let your company just pay for your membership for a year. Get involved. Join a committee, right? This demonstrates your consistency. Ooh, consistency, building trust, win more work. There's a theme. <laughs> it shows your commitment as well. And also attend industry events. Again, showing up's half the battle, right? If I keep seeing Tim over and over again, first of all, we're best friends. <laughs> but yes, thank you for the thumbs up. <laughs> um, but also, I'm like, hey, he, you know, he's smart. He knows what's going on in the industry. He's attending a lot of the same events I am. Maybe we can help each other, right? Even if we are, quote unquote, competitors, People want to work with people they like. Not everybody likes me, I know. <laughs> and not everybody likes you, fine, great. Find those clients and those allies, those partners that enjoy your working style, that enjoy your communication style. And those are your people, that's your tribe. Also too, find creative ways to connect. Obviously Habitat for Humanities, um, you know, obviously very applicable to our industry. Uh, but when I was the marketing manager at Clip Architecture, I made sure everybody in our K-12 practice was part of the eighth mentor program, right? Because you got to pick the schools that we wanted to go and see while you're at those schools, volunteering once a week. Guess who you run into? The principal, the facilities manager. You actually get to see kids, right? <laughs> what does a sixth grader need from a design standpoint? You probably don't know, right? Unless you have kids at home, whatever, that's fine. But when you're in that school environment, and you're helping to train the next generation, you're be observant, right? What, um, you know, what different spaces do they need? Are their water fountains too low or too high? What does that look like, right? Be an engineer, observe, and solve the problems since you already have that next answer. All right, I know I keep banging this over, be the problem solver. You're already doing this as engineers, like you said, been to school for a number of years, you got your PE, I'm not here to teach you how to be a problem solving engineer. <laughs> you have to be an engineer. But to be a problem solver from a business development standpoint, what does that look like? Lots of communication, folks. Communicate early and often. Follow up with your clients. Follow up with them right after the project, right? Ask them for the next project. Um, make sure that you are staying top of mind with whoever your ideal client is. Also, as you're talking to your clients, identify those must-haves versus wish list items. And when I say that, every project has um, you know, a basis, basis partners, sorry, <laughs> um, of what makes a great project, right? All the standards, you've got doors, windows, lights, HVAC, water swimming, great. What are some of those wish list items that that client really, really cares about, right? So that if you meet the must-haves and your firm is able to deliver even one of those wish list items, do you know how much better you look? It's like, oh, they listened to me, first of all, when I asked them what the wish list items were. They wrote it down and they delivered. <gasps> Starting to build a little trust, right? I, I wanna work with you again, right? Because you listen to me. These are very basic principles, but people don't do it often enough and certainly not consistently enough. Also, face problems head on, <laughs> right? Uh, I think we heard from Dr. Uh, Ennis yesterday be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Be comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? Nobody likes to talk about problems, but if you are able to get on the phone right away as the problem is happening on your project, and even better, provide a solution, you've already got three or four different options for that client, guess what? You're my new favorite person, right? There's problems going on in everyone's personal lives, in the world, in our projects. Be that problem solver. Face it head on, communicate it early and often. 
All right, then also too, please, please, please say thank you. Right, I know uh, there's a lot of different things going on in the world right now. I think everybody could be a little kinder to each other, right? <laughs> and also say thank you. It's very, I used to have all of my uh, K-12 principles and well, I guess the hotel too. We would write thank you notes, handwritten thank you notes to the client right after the project. Thank you for the opportunity to work with you guys. We're so glad we we're able to achieve one of those wish list items that you wanted, right? Can't wait to work with you again. And I can tell you this because when going back to the ACE mentor program, we went into a middle school and went into the principal's office, literally had a whole board of all the thank you notes that my principals have, wrote, have written. Proud moment, proud mama moment. I was like, oh, yes, it's working. <laughs> They're saving it. That's just impactful. And it is so easy to do. Right, thank you, literally. Um, also, too, uh, not enough people do this, conducting a project or proposal debrief. I put proposal debrief on there as your low-hanging fruit. Uh, guess what? You may not always get an honest answer, right, from the people conducting those debriefs. I say forget that. Focus on project debriefs. Again, sit down with your client as soon as that closeout happens or your portion of the job is finished to find out three things, or three of each. Top three things that went well. What did your firm do really well? What are the top three challenges that you overcame, right? How are you being that problem solver? And when you talk about it and you write it down, client remembers that, right? <laughs> and then in that same conversation, ask for the next job, right? Even if it didn't go well, you know, if you have these three things, maybe it's a list of 10 that didn't really go well. Who cares? Ask for that next job. Say, you know what, sir? I would love to prove you wrong. We did all these things. We, yes, we overcame them. They were challenges, but give us another opportunity to wow you. Right? And if things went well, that's great. You're building more trust and you're getting the next job. Also, another uh, tip, since you're going to be doing a lot of communication, a lot of follow-up, uh, compose some email templates, responses. And if you're really fancy, get ChatGPT to do it for you. Ooh, right? Personalize that. Um, but I have a Word document that I save, that I belabored over of how to write a follow-up to, to a meeting email, how to write an email to schedule lunch or coffee, and just checking in. You're gonna be doing lots of this as seller doers, right? Consistently staying top of mind, communicating. Let's only have anxiety about that email once, right? <laughs> so that you can save it, copy and paste, personalize it, send it to that client, and stay top of mind. All right, so now we're gonna switch gears a little bit to talk about some situational business development strategies, right? What do you do when you're at client meetings, happy hours, uh, conferences? We're gonna do a little before, during, after. Still with me? All right. So client meeting, OAC meetings. Everybody's been in this room, I guarantee, has been in a client meeting. That is in any interaction, whether you're at their office, you're on the job site, maybe they come into your office, and you're interfacing uh, with clients. I always check the calendar invite. Who's going to be there, right? Identify that one person you already know that could be your ally, right? So if you are maybe bringing up a dissenting point of view or something that's unpopular, hopefully you've got an ally in the room to back you up, right? Um, also to identify that one person you don't know, right? Because as a seller doer, you need to be consistently building your network, right? So figure out the people you don't know, make sure you meet them. During the client meeting, again, obvious, but most people have a very hard time to do this. Listen more than you speak, right? And identify those decision makers. Who is the person in the room that everyone's going like this? They're turning their head. Right, they're deferring to Jane over here. She is the woman, the buck stops with her. Guess what, you need to meet Jane, right? You need to take her to lunch, take her to coffee, right? Because she's the one that's making the decisions and you need to be uh, with her and with her friends, right? So follow up with those decision makers. Again, getting back to those email responses, you go to an OAC meeting, you figure out who Jane is, you already have your email template ready to go, hopefully personalize it again, and get that meeting with them, secure it. All right, next up is happy hours or events that are a little bit more informal, right? We've all kind of been to these. Um, my trick that I like to do before an event is invite another seller doer from another company, right? That we can be buddies with, honestly, right? Sometimes you go into a room, even for someone like me who's fairly extroverted, I still get nervous, right? And so having someone else that you know who is in a similar role as you, you can divide and conquer. Right? Meet more people, maybe that person can introduce you to someone that they know or they don't know, whatever that is, just plan ahead. 
Uh, and during uh, the uh, happy hour, instead of exchanging business cards, because I never have any, <laughs> there are some in the back of the room, but usually not in the right purse for the event that I'm going to, um, share your LinkedIn profile on your smartphone. If you bring up your LinkedIn, you can do it right now if you want. Uh, LinkedIn, you go to search, click on that little weird uh, uh, square there, and you get your own QR code. People can scan that, automatically be connected to you. Deal, deal, win-win, and you don't need business cards. Um, but for those people that didn't have a LinkedIn and you come home with a stack of business cards, I usually tell people to connect with those people right away. So I take my stack, go on LinkedIn, do, 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 click, look them up, send them connection requests. Also make a list of your follow-ups. You know, what, what did you promise people at this event? If you're like, hey, yeah, let's get coffee. We'll actually do it, right? <laughs> send them an email. What days are you available? Let's get coffee, get on your calendar, show up, do the meeting, ask for the next job. Uh, industry events. So these are more kind of formal education events, training, HCC's having one May 17th, business practices workshop. Um, this is what I encourage my clients to do internally, is to find out who's attending from your firm. And I say never have more than three people go to the same event. Um, again, when I was at Clip Architecture, I had a Monday morning standing meeting with the principals and the project leaders, and I said, who's going where this week? What events are going on? Um, who's attending them? So that we could make sure that it looked like our firm was everywhere, right? All of our principals were at different events. Um, it was based on their practice, whatever their focus is. Um, so it's a great way to divide and conquer, and again, make sure that you have coverage at each of these industry events. During, be an active participant, right? Ask questions and write down one thing that you learned. Just one, it's not hard, right? Again, everybody in here in this room has a different perspective, different experience level. We can all learn at least one thing from someone else in the room. Then afterwards, please, please, please stay for the networking, right? I know that I'm a slave to my calendar and I go from one event to the next to the next. I look like a chicken with my head cut off, right? Give yourself that extra 30 minutes on the tail end of event for the networking, because people do tend to hang out, right? They check in. That's your opportunity to have more face time, ask questions, um, maybe share something that you learned. Share your expertise, right? Stay for the networking. Um, now then take that one thing that you wrote down, that you learned, and if it makes you feel if it's applicable to one of your clients, send it to them. Say, hey, I attended this business practices workshop. They had this really interesting, um, idea about how to deal with taxes. Ooh, everybody wants to save on taxes, right? Pass it out, share it. Um, also, you can also, if you're feeling brave, post on LinkedIn. <laughs> Tim does a great job on this. I know I'm picking on you, Tim. <laughs> um, share what you've learned, right? It shows that you have a, a commitment to the industry, right? You're invested in learning and educating yourself. Also, that your company is invested in you and they're paying money for you to go to these events. You might as well share what you learned. Next up is conferences. Now, hopefully, everybody did all of these things before they got here, right? <laughs> Number one, <laughs> exactly. Update your personal LinkedIn profile. Again, I can't tell you how many new PMs we had starting uh, when I was at Clip that we sent to conferences, sent to the AIA conference up in Keystone, all right? So that's overnight, travel, hotel, and a car rental. And these people were exchanging information. They still had their old firm that they were <laughs> under on their LinkedIn profile. They were misrepresenting the company that paid for them to be there. Ah! Like, <laughs> please, don't do that, at the very least. Make sure you know where you're working. Um, also, review attendee or speaker lists. I know attendee lists aren't always available, but the speakers are. And identify that one person or, or firm that you want to meet. Maybe it's one of the exhibitors out here that you're like, you know what? I want to um, up my life health trust, I think that's right, <laughs> the insurance, whatever that is, make sure you go meet that person, right? Um, and then also to work to uh, practice your elevator pitch. You're going to be doing this a lot as you meet new people or even reconnecting with people you haven't seen in a while. Who you are, what you do, and what value to bring to your firm. Three things, very easy. All right, so during the conference, actually meet those people <laughs> that you identified beforehand, right? Make sure you're following up, get in front of them, ask those questions. Here are my go-tos, right? What made you attend this conference, right? Why are you here? Oh, my, my firm paid for me to be here. Okay, why? Keep asking questions. It's uncomfortable, but get comfortable at being uncomfortable. Also, what's one thing you've learned? I'm all about the one thing, obviously, it's a central theme here. 
but it's, in a, you know, it's a good a conversation starter for sure. Then afterwards, again, do what you say you're going to do. If you meet people and you're exchanging business cards, your LinkedIn profiles, and you're like, hey, I'd love to invite you to the, uh, our next networking event. Make sure you do that, please, right? <laughs> Don't just make it for FaceTime. Do what you say you're going to do. Uh, then also what I encourage my clients to do is to host an internal conference debrief, right? You guys are all here. You're away from emails and clients and phone calls. There's all these things going on. But when you get back on Monday, yes, your inbox is going to be ridiculous. <laughs> but take the time to do a conference debrief. What did you guys learn here, right? Again, your company invested in you and paid for you to be here. You need to share that information for the people that are coming up. Not only does it help build morale, so if I'm a young person and I see uh, project managers and people that have been with the firm for a long time uh, going to conferences, I'm like, ooh, I want to go to a conference. How do I get there? Right? So now that your young people are now engaged, they're interested, they want to be the ones that get to do that, and then come back and share with everybody else. Seriously, it's these little, little things <laughs> that will really help to make a difference. Um, so that is the end, wrapping up, of my spiel. If you're looking to learn more, uh, my book is going to be published, finally. <laughs> It'll be available in July. I'm doing an official book launch in September, Get Them to Care. It focuses more on your online personal uh, branding, development, those different types of things as a firm. I did want to thank everyone for standing up here and listening to me jabber on, um, but did want to open it up to questions from the group. Don't be shy. Questions, questions. Yes, right? Thank you, Rock. Thank you, Dwayne Johnson. <laughs> you have to be consistent. Uh, anyone can do a blog or a podcast once. Great, and you keep reposting it. But it's the ones that put out c content consistently, and it's valuable content consistently. Those are the ones that you tune into, that you're making sure you don't miss on Spotify, whatever. Um, so yes, consistency, because that builds trust. Other things, what did you learn? Communication styles, right? And how important that is, right? Um, it could also be how you communicate, right? I am a millennial, an elder millennial, <laughs> as they say. I'm a texter, okay? I'm a very good writer, very good reader. I can get some good information in a text, right? Some people don't appreciate that, right? Their, their phone's blowing up. They want an email. Or even better yet, they want a phone call. Figure out what your client's communication style is and making sure that you match it. Right? Because again, you're building trust with them. They know you're going to pick up the phone. Ooh, right? Pick up that phone call. <laughs> call, talk to people. What did you learn, sir? You read that? No more than three people at the event. Yes, right? <laughs> yeah. I would say that a conference is the exception, right? <laughs> For sure. Uh, but when you're at those industry training events, uh, no more than three, right? Let's spread the love, make sure that your people are going to different events and gathering different information. If you're consistently going to the same ACC Colorado events, which I'm not saying that you should not go to, but um, if you're only going to those, you're missing out on all these other industry events and things where you could be interfa interfacing more directly with your clients. Yes, Ms. John. Yes. So, uh, so the question is, you know, for writing best practices articles, where should you start with that? Where do you get them published? How do you do that? So my recommendations uh, when I'm working with clients is to focus on a topic that you really care about. So transportation, right? What is the one thing that you're passionate about, right? What can you get excited about and volunteer your extra time? Because this is, again, this is not billable, right? Not billable, folks. So make it sure it's something that you're interested in. You do the research on that topic usually 800 to 1,000 words uh, is a good start, right? Uh, Colorado Real Estate Journal has a minimum of 850 words per uh, best practices article. Um, other topics to consider are what's going on, again, what are those external market factors that are affecting some of your clients right now, right? What's, uh, what's CDOT's biggest pain right now, pain point, and how can you solve that? They have a lot, right? So spread the love. <laughs> yes, Larry. Sure, I, set boundaries, okay? I know we went back to, let's see, which slide is that? Whew, my overwhelming chart for that split. Um, again, if you're looking for numbers, 
uh, for your billable time, right? Depending upon what type of firm you're at, how old your firm is, how much brand recognition they have, and what their seller do experience is. These to me are good starting points, right? And maybe it's 70% uh, of your month is billable. And that 30% of your month, however many days that is, folks, I'm not a numbers person, <laughs> but uh, make sure you dedicate that time and you carve it out. It's just like anything else for me. Uh, so for my week as a seller doer, uh, most events are on Wednesdays and Thursdays. So those are my uh, BD days, business development. I'm at events, I'm talking to people, I'm scheduling meetings. So that on Monday, Tuesday, and Friday, I am billable, right? I'm doing what I'm saying I'm going to do. I have met new people. I've hopefully brought in a few more projects. Now I got to actually do the projects because it's just me, right? So uh, that's kind of having that seller doer mentality. But you have to carve out the time, Larry. You got to make sure you do it because again, if you imagine that seesaw, where's my other seesaw? Oh, my seesaws. Uh, when you get built way down by billable work and your business development opportunities are left floating. Your competitors are swarming in to take those opportunities that you left hanging out there, right? It's the competitive nature of, of the business. So make sure you are carving out that time and doing those business development activities. Other questions? Yes, sir. Not a question, just the fact that I think one of the points that I like is, is meeting with appropriate IEs, yes. knowing uh, even at least who I'm going to talk to. Right, exactly, right? Identify those people. Do do a little bit of planning, right? But also to get creative in the different groups that you belong to, right? Um, it's great to be consistent, right? To build trust, currency, to win more work. Um, but also diversify a little bit and make sure that people on your teams, the other project managers are, are going to different events and being involved in different associations than you. Other questions? Yes? In terms of hosting content on LinkedIn, do you have any best practices? Sure. So I would say uh, start with yourself first, right? Um, a lot of these seller doers in here, uh, again, your marketing folks are most likely posting to your company page. But so for you as a person, uh, at, on, as an, uh, on your individual personal profile, write down that one thing you learned and share that, right? So a typical post might be, you know, I'm so excited. I just came back from the ACC Colorado Con uh, Conference. I attended the seller doer best practices seminar, and I learned that X, Y, Z, right? And share that out, hit send, Ooh, right? And what does that show? It shows that your firm has a commitment to you, invest in you to allow you to go to the conference, right? And maybe ignore a few emails for the day at least. Uh, it also shows that you're, you know, you're invested in the, in the community, in the industry, right? You're willing to attend these events, share what you learned, um, and really put it out there. So how to answer your question a little bit? So what is one thing that you sometimes see that is not good practice? Don't post your cat videos, okay? Like I know, <laughs> but LinkedIn gets cringy, right? There's all sorts of stuff on there where you're like, ooh, should I have posted that? Save those cringy posts for Facebook or don't post them at all. Um, but be professional, right? Um, oh gosh, bad examples? I mean, there's unfortunately have too many <laughs> to kind of list. Uh, a big one for you guys is if you're on a job site and you're taking photos and you want to show, oh, hey, I was at that job site, Make sure those photos are OSHA compliant, okay? I've had, see, I, my hand to whoever you pray to or whatever. Um, I had a client get a $25,000 fine from OSHA because they posted a photo where no one had their safety glasses on, half the people had their hard hats on in that photo. You are liable, right? You're still running businesses. Edit, edit, edit. Right, so if that one person isn't following the rules, chop them out of the photo, get your marketing people to do some Photoshop magic, or just don't post the photo. Bypass the opportunity, save your firm $25,000. So, other stuff, it's a great question. Other things, no, good. Well, again, thank you guys for coming. Again, I hope you learned at least one thing um, and appreciate your time here today.